Cause you took my scars, bruises and broken heart And numbed all the pain Show me how to heal And now I don't feel broken anymore Welcome to All Heart, I'm your host Paul Cardall I want to thank those of you who are joining us for the first time. Welcome to the podcast. For those of you that are rejoining, that have listened to a couple podcasts, maybe you've listened to all of them. Thank you very much. Welcome back. You know, the heart of why I am doing this is because I want to encourage those of you who have discovered a gift to develop that gift so that it becomes a talent. Because once we do that, it helps really shape our purpose to know why we are here, to know what we can contribute. How many of us, and I'm going to raise my hand, how many of us have been at that place where we really did not know what we were meant to do in this world? Some of you may still wonder, why me? What am I supposed to be doing? What can I contribute You know, we see so many people doing such remarkable things and it's like, I can't do that. And, or you look at another person and you're like, I wish I could do that. Well, as you've listened to my guests, they're all different. So many different backgrounds. And some of them discovered a gift that they had early on in life and others discovered that gift much later. And that gift led them to understand why they were made, what their purpose was in being here and what they're contributing to the world. And I'll just give you a couple examples. Richard Paul Evans is an author. He wrote The Christmas Box. This is a New York Times bestseller that sold millions of copies. He didn't discover that he could write until he was 30 years old. Before that, he was an advertising executive who was responsible for doing politician ads doesn't seem fulfilling at all does it but he wanted to show his daughters how much he loves them convey it in something that was timeless so he decided to write a story that story was you know copied and distributed by just neighbors and it propelled him into a full-blown career as a multi number one New York Times bestselling author, he discovered he was an author. Sometimes these gifts fall upon us. This is kind of the case that I fell in when after my third open heart surgery as a 14 year old, I was just going with the flow and trying to figure out life. By the time I was 16, I had a good friend who played the piano and people used to gather around him and it was mesmerizing to watch him play root beer rag by Billy Joel or the entertainer by Joplin. And then when he would play heart and soul, other people will join in. And I was like, well, I took piano lessons for, you know, six months when I was eight years old, but I quit. My mom quit because I quit. And, uh, my teacher, well, she gave up on me. She told my mom that, uh, I was wasting her time and money. This was my great aunt who I love and who is no longer with us. But it's amazing how at that time I didn't stick with it. And then later on in life, I was like, man, I wish I had done that. I wish I had stuck with it. So I was watching my friend play. I was watching all these people gather around him. And this was after I'd had my uh, third major open heart surgery. So I was still trying to figure out why am I here? What is my purpose? I had scars. You know, I was damaged goods. And then shortly before our senior year of high school, my friend Dave was going up the canyon with a bunch of friends at the end of the school year. A couple friends had thrown a wallet out the window and Dave volunteered to go pick it up. And this was really just a a dangerous thing to do, but somebody needed to get the wallet and Dave decided he would go out and get the wallet. Well, as he went out to get the wallet, the sun was setting over the canyon and This car could not see him, and he got struck by this car. And it it threw his body like 30 yards, and and he died. And I found out about it about an hour later. A friend called me. He says, you know, Dave's gone. I was what? 
it just made no sense to me because to put it into perspective, you know, I was, I'd been fighting for my life since I was born with congenital heart disease, the number one cause of infant related deaths. And out of nowhere, you know, this friend who's perfectly healthy is killed. And I was trying to understand why am I still here? Why is my father spending a fortune on medical bills? And what is this all about? Well, my parents living room had a piano. It was an old upright Kauai and I'd played it when I was eight years old on, you know, doing those piano lessons, but I really hadn't touched it. And I went and I sat down at the piano because it reminded me of Dave. And I looked at the piano, like it was the mystery of life and the, the keys were the puzzle pieces. And, you know, how do I figure out this puzzle life? What is it all about? What does it mean? And I hit a note, it was a B flat. And I hit it in a way that there was a tone that was so calming and soothing. And then I kind of slipped, but I hit this G note. And then I hit a D. And those three notes, it was as though there was this melody, like this flowing feeling of peace like warm water coming over you on a cold day, a warm blanket coming all around you when you're, when you're cold, your mother hugging you as a child. I felt so much comfort in those three notes that right there and then there was this divine higher power. It was God basically saying, everything is going to be okay. Dave is with me. And I felt such peace in that moment. It, you know, it became, it came as a result of playing three notes on the piano. I started to work on the piano to figure out more. I had many questions and I wanted answers. And as I would create three notes here, three notes there and try to arrange chords, you know, I'd play it just kind of developed. I discovered this gift of music. I worked on it. I developed it. It became a talent. And I wrote my first song about my friend, Dave's farewell. And I thought, you know, I should go play this for his parents. I want them to know how much I love them, how much I love their son. I was grateful for his friendship. And this is something that came out as a result of that tragedy. And I got up the courage to call, went over sat down, told him what had happened. And I started to play this. And obviously Dave's mother was very emotional. Father was very emotional, but something unique happened. They called the neighbors and asked them to come over and listen to the song. And they were emotional. And in that moment, it was like, why were they asking other people to come and listen when I was just trying to do this for them? Well, it was because the music had impact. There was such emotion and such healing in the song that they were feeling strength and renewal. The grief wasn't gone, but it was like an antidote, something to soothe the trauma. And when somebody asks you to do something again, usually it's because they like it. And I began creating and composing and sharing. Got my first job in a restaurant. People were paying me to play music. I'd get tips. Well, it all evolved into the career that I have now. And everything I've done since discovering that gift, developing it into a talent, my purpose in life is to create music to help you access the divine to tap into emotions that are very difficult to receive in order to be cleansed and feel renewed and healed. And, you know, all those years ago, I thought this was just something spiritual that was happening, something that was just beautiful that was happening. But there's actually clinical studies now to vindicate what we've all felt all along is that there is something happening to the body that God created in order for us to feel cleansed and healed through the power of music. 
And on my website, paulcardall.com, I actually have the benefits, all these studies under the music therapy link, all these benefits of listening to music or playing an instrument for, but I want to go right now to uh, kent.tech.com. Kent uh, obviously is a prestigious university. They've done these studies as well. Here are eight things that happen to you when you listen to music and why you should take the time to listen, create a playlist. And uh, number one, listening to music makes you happier. Obviously, we've got some sad songs, but what happens is your brain releases a happy hormone. It's a dopamine when you listen and neurologists have discovered this, you know, early on, there was a study called the neuroscience of music chill by the Montreal Neurological Institute and hospital. And they've said that dopamine will release from your body. Now, dopamine is released to give you pleasure. Dopamine is released to help you heal. And so when you are listening to music, scientifically, your body is being healed. Second music enhances running performance. I can't tell you how many times people have said, I listen to your music when I run marathons. And I said, well, my music is so calm and relaxing. Doesn't it make you tired and want to lay down? They're like, no, absolutely not. On the contrary, it eases my mind so I can focus. So it says runners who listen to fast or slow motivational music completed the first 800 meters of their run faster than those that listened to calm music or ran without. So it sounds like if you're running from something, you better put on that old Sony Walkman and start jamming and listening to some music to improve your ability. Uh, the third thing it does is it lowers stress and it proves your health. So uh, let me say that more clear. Music lowers stress and improves health. Said so listening to music can decrease levels of the stress hormone cortisol. Now, if there's ever been a time where we definitely need to release the stress. It's now. The study showed that people's immune systems were boosted when they actively participated in making music by playing various percussion instruments and singing. You know what that tells me and tells you, I'm sure, is that you don't have to know how to play an instrument to do some percussion, you know? So New Year's Eve, what you ought to do is go bang on some pots and pans and that will definitely boost your immune system. You'll feel joy and do that with your kids. And uh, it's the act of playing instruments. So I've told uh, patients in hospitals that when you're frustrated, if there's a keyboard around or, or a piano and most hospitals do, just pound, just pound on it. And then experiment just hitting one note at a time and see what happens to you. Now, here's the fourth thing. Music helps you sleep better. I can't tell you how often I'll put on a playlist of music. Sometimes I'll put on my own music. Sometimes I'll put on other artists that like acoustic music. And uh, it's random what I listen to. I'll go through phases where I, I listen to the same thing. You know, it's kind of like a man who wears the same shirt. <laughs> I'll just keep listening to the exact same song for, for months on end. And eventually my wife will get in the car and go, are you ever going to change that song? Kind of like, are you ever going to change that shirt? And so that's, what's interesting is music does help you sleep better. And so I'll have a playlist where I will listen for the first couple of hours. And sometimes I'd fall right asleep. It says a study showed that students who listened to relaxing classical music for 45 minutes before bed slept significantly better than those who slept with an audio book or listen to nothing at all. How many of us watch TV and then try to go to bed and we have anxiety? We watch some violent show or we try to watch comedy or something to get our mind off stuff. So listening to music is something that's gonna benefit us. I've got emails from moms who have said, you know, I put on your music to help the kids wind down. And I love that because some mothers just need to drink wine. <laughs> but they're winding down, winding down to listening to the music. And here's another really big benefit of music. Music reduces depression. Over 350 people across the world suffer from depression and 90% of them experience insomnia. So sleep research found that symptoms of depression decreased largely 
when those who listen to classical music. So again, the type of music I've been creating, it's a minimalist classical style. The album December that uh, is out, or if you're listening on uh, December 2nd, it's out tomorrow, December 3rd. But it is specifically created with the intent to soothe your mind, calm your mind, release the dopamine to give you that pleasure, that stimulant that's going to help you relax and be focused. So that is why they're saying students who listen to classical music, if you're having a challenging day, it will lift your spirits. These are scientific proven facts. These are the studies that are done by the Neuroscience of Music Chill at the Montreal Neurological Institute and Hospital. Harvard Health has many of these studies done. Again, these are on my website, paulcardall.com. The sixth thing is, how many of you like to listen to music when you drive? Well, it says it elevates your mood. Because so many of us get agitated when we're driving. We People are cutting us off. We get anxious. We get angry. It says, I'm sure you'll agree that one, this one, that music helps our moods and also helps us concentrate, concentrate, concentrate better when we're driving. And there was a study in the Netherlands where my dad's family, uh, the ancestors are all from. It found that music can positively impact your mood while driving and consequently lead to safer driving than if you weren't listening to anything at all. And how many of you have pulled up to a stoplight and you've got the guy or the girl in the next car over just boosting, boom, boom, just really loud stuff? Well, that's usually my wife listening to Keith Sweat or something. No, or, or Run DMC. That's my wife. But sometimes it'll just be so obnoxious. You're kind of like, oh, no. So what I do and what I've done in the past is I'll crank uh, the Tabernacle Choir doing the Hallelujah Chorus or, or I'll crank something opera. Pavarotti. And, uh, and then I'll look over and I'll go, yeah, what do you think of that? So it's just kind of fun, fun to do. Um, I know I'm kind of a dork sometimes. The seventh thing is music strengthens learning and memory. And this is critical for all of us that have trouble remembering. A study has shown that music helps you learn and recall information better. You know, when you're listening to that song, you couldn't remember the lyrics and the song starts and all of a sudden you remember the lyrics. Well, that's a proven fact that you can recall events and recall things if, if you are listening to certain music. So participants who are musicians learned better with neutral music and tested better with positive music, whereas non-musicians learned better with positive music and tested better with neutral music. Isn't that interesting? Now, here's the last thing. Music increases verbal intelligence. So a study has shown that after one month of music lessons, children between the ages of four and six, 90% significantly improve their ability to understand words and explain their meaning. That ought to tell you that the type of music that you have in your car when your kids are in the car they know subconsciously what is being said. I remember Sting giving this advice, lead singer of the police. He really was the police. They asked him, how do you deal with your kids listening to certain types of music that might be offensive? Because parents try to dictate, you know, what do you listen to? Sting said the very best approach. I have my children and his children are all grown now. He's 70. I have my children print the lyrics and then we read them together as a family and discuss whether they make society better. Are they trying to educate our culture or are they harming our culture? Are they damaging our culture? And I thought that was so good. And I've started to integrate that or imp imp implement that into my own relationship with my daughter, who is 16, who loves music. My younger daughter is into plants right now. Uh, she has a window and she's put all her plants in the window. And I ask her how her plants are doing. She's nine. And she goes, you know, dad, 
they are living their best life. And two of the plants, she told me, the leaves are growing and they're getting taller. So they started touching each other. So she decided to have the, the, the two plants get married. <laughs> so she performed a, a marriage. Uh, she put uh, a bow tie, a miniature bow tie that she made on one and uh, a little veil on the other. So I thought that was adorable. But meanwhile, my other daughter who is 16 loves music and she plays an instrument and she can sit down and play my music. Uh, she is far much further than I ever was at her age when I was just trying to figure things out. But we'll print up lyrics or we'll discuss lyrics. And uh, she starts to recognize in that moment, like, oh, yeah, gosh, man, I don't, I'm not sure I really like what they're saying. So education on lyrics can help the, ch your, your, the people you care about decide whether or not that's something they really want to pursue and listen to. So listening to music will uh, increase the verbal intelligence. So it says, as you can see, there are so many benefits to music and it has become an effective universal language, according to new music uh, research, that can communicate basic human feelings, regardless of the listener's culture and ethnic background. That's one thing I want to take a minute with. Music is a language that unites people of all different backgrounds. You can go to a concert and be united in the singing of the songs, whereas you may have cut them off on the road. They may have cut you off on the road. You may have, you know, not gotten along with them. You may have not disagreed with them, but then under the umbrella of music, you're going to have this unity that starts to take place. And that's one of the most powerful things that happens when we listen to music. So this album, December, let me tell you a little bit about that project. I've done many albums and they are different. The last album was The Broken Miracle, which was a great opportunity to collaborate with some Grammy nominated artists who I respect. Thompson Square, they are a country uh, Grammy nominated duo. They, they had that song, Are You Gonna Kiss Me or Not? And I actually interviewed them on, I think it was the first or second podcast. David Archuleta, he's a brilliant artist. He sang this song I wrote for my wife called My Heart Beats For You. Matt Hammett, who was a guest on this podcast. Ty Herndon, uh, quite a few artists that I was able to collaborate on. And, you know, I, prior to that, I had a Christmas album. And I was very fortunate to have C.C. Winans, the most awarded Grammy uh, gospel singer of all time, was on that album doing Oh Holy Night. So I've had these great experiences collaborating with artists, having some songs, but after my heart transplant, I wrote an album called new life. And I put a lot of pressure on myself to create something that I thought would be timeless because I had just survived death. Doctors had literally taken the heart that was damaged and diseased that I was born with out of my chest and technically, you know, I've said this, I, I, I was dead, but we've come up with enough knowledge by the grace of God to know how to raise people from the dead. They took the heart of a donor, a young man who had signed up to be an organ donor. His heart, after he had died, was removed from his chest and put into my chest cavity. And the doctors went to grab the pedals to, you know, you have to jumpstart the heart and the heart was already beating and it was as though it was meant to be. And so they literally raised me from the dead temporarily. And it's a phenomenal thing. So how do you create music to tell that story? I put a lot of pressure on myself. I wanted to have impact. I wanted people to know there's a God because God had orchestrated this incredible miracle through the doctors who performed this surgery. You know, you have Mozart who composes and then you have the pianist in our time that performs it. And that's kind of like this transplant, God orchestrated it, but the surgeons performed it. And I put pressure on myself and I, you know, when I was waiting for the heart, I wrote Gracie's theme, which has gone on to be streamed almost a billion times. 
Life and Death, an arrangement of a Michael Giacchino tune. Well, I wanted to get back to that type of music, that album that I ended up releasing after three years, I think of, it was three, two to three years after my transplant. I thought I'd have it out right away, but it was two to three years later. I struggled, but it became my biggest selling album and Spain made it like album of the year. And I'd never been to Spain in my life. So I wanted to have an album that kind of took a, took me back to the vulnerability of being human, what it's like to go through something rather difficult and then to come out on top. And the pandemic has been challenging for all of us. Uh, my parents have lost friends to COVID. Uh, there's been so many challenges and politicians have tried to divide us. And yet music seems to help bring us back together. And as I started to come up with the idea for this album, you know, when I was recording the broken miracle at the studio, there was this old piano, an upright piano that was in the back room. And I would sit down and I'd play it while the engineers were getting everything else set up so we could have a professional recording to make the broken miracle. And as I was just sitting at this piano in the back room, I was, it was, it was as though I was like back in the hospital and I was creating from my heart. Just gratitude to, for the beautiful world we live in, no matter how complex and ironic it is. We go through these painful things and yet that pain reminds us how much we love our children, our families, our spouse. And in those moments, it's just, it's all worth it. So I want to get, I wanted to get back to that. And, and I called up the engineer and I said, listen, I want to come in and record an album. I just want to sit at that piano that's broken, slightly out of tune. I want to dim the lights and I just want to start playing what I feel. I don't want to have anything pre-written. I just want to start playing how I feel and how I think other people are feeling. And that's when the magic began because right away I was like, oh, I don't know if this is going to work. But then you make it through a, through a song and you know, I'm improvising. I'm like, I don't know if you've ever seen a jazz musician who can just, you know, take a couple chords and then just start playing, but it's jazz. Well, I'm not a jazz artist. I'm kind of a contemporary classical pianist, but I'm a very minimalist uh, in my approach. I like what Mozart says to utilize the space between the notes because there's room for us to breathe and to think and to feel. And there's just longing that takes place. There's a lot of sadness in my music and yet I bring in the elements of hope. So you'll have minor chords and the major chords and I want to build it up to where you know there's a resolve that things work out, that we go through difficult things, but that the wound heals in time. I've got countless scars on my body to remind me that I once suffered and they tell my story and I love those scars. Every time I see them in the mirror, I go, whew, glad that's over with, but look at what I've learned. So as I'm sitting at this piano, I go through like four hours of recording that first night and I was actually very disappointed. I wasn't sure if this was going to actually work if I could pull it off. Came back the next night and having told my wife, you know, I'm really discouraged. I just don't know. She goes, well, you know, go in, do your best. You're great. <laughs> She's always a good, uh, pep talker, very optimistic. And I went in, I sat down, dim the lights, same scenario. And I started creating and composing. And, and then I asked the engineer, I said, okay, we've got about you know, seven hours of music, 40, 50 songs that are totally like made up on the fly, except for Mockingbird, this Mockingbird song. And the reason I did Hush, Little Baby, the Mockingbird song, I was thinking about my kids and I was thinking about when they were little and how they're getting older and you want them to be young again. They never again will be that age. And so you're thinking, how do I convey that? How do I, how do I communicate that? And I started just playing that simple, beautiful lullaby. And so that's the only song on the album that is not original. 
And I had the engineer just send me everything. I said, send me, you know, out of all these, send me the 20 best that you think are great. And that was a lot of pressure on him. And he sent them over. And then I narrowed it down to 20. And then I narrowed it down to 14. Then I handed it off to <laughs> Josie, uh, who did the string arrangements with Gideon Klein, who is her fiance. And they worked on the Broken Miracle and had been on tour with uh, so many incredible artists, worked with uh, Thompson Square and gosh, the list goes on in Nashville. Uh, Natalie Grant, a uh, bunch of artists. And I handed him to her and I said, just, I want you to compliment what I'm doing and just lay down some strings that you feel match the vibe. So we didn't even have anything written for her. And then a couple of weeks later, she sent it back to me. And I sat in my car you always got to do the car test first because that's where most of us listen to our music. I sat in the car and I began to listen. And I, I started to cry really because some miracle by the grace of God had happened. This music seemed to have poured out through me that really is not mine. I, you know, it's something divine music because you feel it. We feel it. We all feel it. And yet I can't claim to be the author of it because there was something bigger and more beautiful going on because I know God's kids are hurting. God loves his children. And through music, we're able to heal and help one another. And um, the album just blew me away. And I thought, wow, this is the, this is like new life. This is like Gracie's theme. This is like life and death. These songs are so beautiful. So then you have to title the songs. You have to put meaning and more purpose to them. You have to give them a name. And the thing with music is you're going to get whatever you want out of the song. Somebody may go, oh, that's what that song is about. And that's good for that person. But for you, you're going to go, this is what I felt. This is what I think it's about. And, you know, musicians and creators, we love to, debate what songs or artists intended. You know, Paul Simon, I don't know if you're familiar with much of his work like Graceland, but he, he says, my, I don't write my music about anything. I just want a lyric that rolls off the tip of my tongue. And then everybody else tells me what it's about. And that's the beauty in music is it's a customized language for each of us. And I think God is trying to teach us the things we most need to know. And if we listen close enough, we'll hear God say, Everything's going to be okay. I love you. I got you. So as you listen to these songs, I, I put them in an order as though to take us through the fourth quarter, which can be very difficult, a stressful time, a beautiful time of year. It starts with September winds. You know, the fall leaves start to fall. Things start to kind of die or go into to to hibernation and then you have the new moon rising this beautiful new moon um and i take you through this process of advent which is the welcoming that uh you know of in the christian faith of the birth of christ that that's going to happen and it's also the promise that he will return and so i take you through the the season of fall leading up into the holidays and then all the way to the new year. So it's taking you on this journey and it's not Christmas music, but I do have a song called leaving Nazareth. And I imagined as I was listening to it, you know, Mary, the story in the new Testament is Mary is pregnant and she's about to give birth to the son of God. She may have heard, you know, the prophecies about who the Messiah is. And so She's carrying this child that she knows is unique and different. And I thought, how many moms discover before their child is born because of technology now that their child has some type of unique illness is different. And they have that burden of protection and making sure their child receives everything they need. Because when I was in my mother, there was no indication to her 
that I had only half a heart. But once I was born, because her little sister, when she was six years old, when my mother was six years old, her little baby sister died after only two, two days because she was born with a heart defect. So I come into this world, I have a heart defect. You can imagine what my mother was thinking, feeling, and what the burden must have been. So moms can relate in a way to Mary, the mother of God, and the burden to carry what must that have been like? And so these are the types of things I like to add meaning to the music. I take a feeling, I go, what is this? And how do I explain it? And so, but the overall goal on December is I want you to get out of it what you feel you need most. Uh, if you are a believer, ask God uh, to, to give you what you need. And I guarantee you will feel what God wants you to know. If you are not a believer, um, I hope the music helps you realize and recognize there is a higher power. That higher power is something I relied on heavily when I was in a heart transplant scenario. Not sure if I would live or die. Because, you know, honestly, as a child, they never said, okay, you need to, uh, you're going to live a long time and plan for retirement. It was, you might not live through the years. So I was thinking about what comes next after this life. And so I was thinking about an afterlife. I was obsessed with it. And when you go through these things, you do start to wonder and you start to ask questions. And that's kind of been the pattern of my whole life to where I am now. And I've never felt closer to God than ever before as I've gone through these journeys and process things. So that is the gist of the new album, December. We have sheet music that you can play uh, some of it is free on my website. I have music videos on my YouTube channel that you can watch. And they're just visually stunning scenes of nature. There are some videos that are more specific, trying to say something that you can get what you think is out of. But you could put those up on a screen on YouTube and your kids will wind down. Um, and... Um, yeah, just more to come. So the benefits of listening to music are great. And so I just want to encourage you to listen to music, learn to play an instrument. If you don't know how, keep one around. If you want to pound on it, if you want to just tinkle on it, do whatever. But music is a universal language that unites people that is really just absolutely beautiful. So thank you for joining me on All Heart today. I want to thank my sponsor, doTERRA. They are an essential oil company out of Utah. They've been very supportive of my career. They are also in the business of trying to help heal people. I have this stick called Deep Blue that I love. And uh, I will put that on my fingers. And it actually helps soothe it so I can play. You know, I'm getting older, so I can keep playing the way I want to. So thank you, doTERRA, for the Deep Blue and got my uh this is better than incense guys i've got my diffuser here doing my wild orange and i just love that whole vibe of it when i recorded december i actually had a diffuser in there and putting off some really good smells so thank you doTERRA all right everybody we'll see you next time on all heart be sure to subscribe and share this podcast or one of the other ones that you've been inspired by with those that you love I appreciate you. All right. God bless. Cause you took my scars, bruises and broken heart, numbed all the pain. Show me how to heal and I.